Let's now analyse a different format of auction called a second price sealed bid auction, widely known as a Vickery auction, after the economist William Vickery, who first formally studied these auctions and was awarded the Nobel Prize for his contributions. So what is a second price sealed bid auction? It's exactly as it sounds. So bidders learn their values and submit their bids. The bidder with the highest bid wins. So far, that's the same as a first price auction. The difference is that the winning bidder pays the second highest of these bids. So they don't pay the value of their own bid. They pay the value of the uh, second highest of the bids and no payment is required otherwise. Now, the first time you hear about this, it sounds unusual, but actually it's very common. This is precisely how eBay works. So on eBay, you can submit the amount that you're willing to bid for an object, and eBay will do the bidding for you and simply make sure that you beat the... Um, if your value is the highest, it will make sure that you win the auction, but it won't go all the way up to the value that you put in as your maximum willingness to pay. Rather, it will just add some increment to make sure you, that you win. So it's implementing a second price sealed bid auction with some, uh, with some small increments involved. The most striking feature of the second price sealed bid auction, the Vickery auction, and why Vickery auctions are so well known and so widely used, is captured in the following proposition. Essentially, the symmetric Nash equilibrium bidding strategy is just to bid honestly. So in a second price sealed bid auction with N bidders who have private independent values that are uniformly distributed on zero to one interval, that can be substantially generalized, but this is what we'll work with today. The symmetric Nash equilibrium bidding strategy is to bid a value, whatever your value is, that is the amount that you should bid. Essentially, a second price sealed bid auction induces in equilibrium honest bidding. There is no incentive in this auction for bidders to shade their bids in any way. An obvious implication of this result is that second price sealed bid auctions are efficient. Whoever has the highest value will submit the highest bid, and so they will win the auction. Of course, they pay an amount equal to the second highest bid. So let's prove that all bidders bidding their honest values, their honest private values, is indeed a Nash equilibrium. So rather than writing out the mathematics, I'll present the intuition of the proof, which you can also read in the lecture notes. So suppose that um, these two bidders are bidding honestly. So player two has a value V2 and is bidding V2. Player three has a value V3 and is bidding V3. So let's consider the behavior of player one, who has a value v1 and asks what should this bidder do in particular in order to establish that honest bidding is a Nash equilibrium we need to argue that there is no uh, benefit from changing his actions given that everybody else is bidding honestly so we'll split this into two cases first we'll look at the case where he will win the auction by bidding honestly and then we'll look at the case where he won't win the auction if he bids honestly. In each case, um, we have to show that there is no benefit to changing his bid. So suppose his value is highest and that honest bidding will win the auction. Well, then player one can think, if I bid more than V1, then I still win. But why would I do this? There's no benefit. Um, I'm only going to pay uh, either the maximum of V2 and V3. So let's imagine V2 is the second highest. If he has the highest value and bids honestly, he will win and he'll pay V2. If he bids a higher amount, he'll still win and he'll still pay V2. So there's no reason to, uh, there's no way to improve his position by increasing his bid. What about decreasing his bid? Well, if he bids less than his true value, as long as it's not too much less, 
then he might still win, but there's no benefit, clearly he still pays v2. But it also in it is possible that if he reduces his bid too much, he might end up losing the auction. And this is an auction he wants to win. He has the highest value, greater than v2, and he's only going to pay v2. So by bidding more than his honest amount, there is no benefit. By bidding slightly less than his true amount, there's no uh, benefit or loss. But by bidding uh, significantly less than his true amount, he might end up losing the auction and foregoing the gains. Now let's have a look at the other case where player one's value is not the highest. So if he submits his true honest bid, his honest value as his bid, then he will not win the auction. Now let's consider changing from this, uh, this strategy. So our player one thinks if I bid less than v1, then I still lose. And there's no benefit to that. So as things stand, he's not going to win. He receives zero and he pays zero. And if he reduces his bid, nothing changes. He still pays zero and receives zero. Should he increase his bid? Well, player one will think if I bid more than v1, then he might still lose, in which case that's not a problem, but there's no benefit. But he might win. And if he wins, um, then he's going to be in trouble because he's going to have to pay an amount v2, which is greater than his v1. So he will actually earn a negative uh, payoff if he wins this auction by bidding more than his true value. Now we've examined all of the different cases, player one realizes that as long as everybody else is bidding honestly, he cannot do any better than if he does the same. So he should also bid honestly. If it's an auction he's going to win, then there is a risk when he tries to reduce his bid and there's no gain from increasing his bid. If it's an auction he's not going to win, then there is no gain from reducing his bid, but there is a risk of in if he chooses to increase his bid. So in all of these cases, he has no reason to change from simply bidding honestly. And that's precisely what happens in a Nash equilibrium. Player one with a value V1 should choose to bid V1. That is his best response. Now that we've analysed the first price sealed bid auction and the second price sealed bid auction formats, we know what the equilibrium bidding functions look like in each of these. In the first price sealed bid auction, bidders should shade their bids, bid less than their honest value. And in the uh, second price sealed bid auction, bidders should submit bids equal to their honest values but only pay, obviously, the bid of the second highest of these uh, submitted values. So what can we say about the expected revenue of these different auction formats? Um, what does the seller expect to receive if he designs the auction as a first price sealed bid auction or as a second price sealed bid auction? Let's go on paper now and analyse this question. OK, so now let's discuss the expected revenue um, that the seller receives when they choose to auction the same object either by a first price seal bid auction or by using a, um, a second price seal bid auction. Okay, so if we remember that the first price uh, first price seal bid auction case, uh, we calculated the Nash equilibrium. We calculated the Nash equilibrium bidding function to be um, B star of whatever your value is, you shade your bid. So you take N minus 1 over N and multiply it by V. Okay, so this was true when we had N players whose values were independent and uniformly distributed on the interval 0 to 1. So that's how we got this result. So what's my expected revenue? How can I say this? Well, I know that the highest bid is going to win. OK, so what I want to know is, well, what's the expected value of the highest bid? So I want to know, so my let's call this expected revenue one. It's going to be, well, the, it's going to be n minus one over n multiplied by the expected value of 
the first order statistic. There it is, it's come back. Okay, so this expected value of the first order statistic is saying, you know, from this random sample, I'm taking the highest of the values. What's the expected value of the highest of our um, random values? And then shade that value because that's what they're actually going to bid. Okay, so uh, this is how you would calculate the expected revenue. Now, we developed a table with these results. If I remember, the expected value of our first order statistics uh, was quite a simple expression, n over n plus 1. Okay, so my expected revenue is n minus 1 over n multiplied by n over n plus 1. And we're done. Okay, we could do some cleaning up. I think in the lecture notes, I show that this is equal to n minus 1 over n plus 1. Okay, so you could practice getting from here to here. Um, oh, it's simple. You just cancel these two. <laughs> so that's, that's a simple cleanup in this case. Uh, so this is the expected revenue. Um, if there are uh, 19 bidders, then we can calculate that the expected revenue will be 18 over 20, uh, which is 0.9. So um, very simple expression. So that's how we calculate the expected revenue of the um, first price sealed bid auction. Well, what about the second bid, the second price? Sealed bid auction. Now, if we remember, the, um, the equilibrium bidding function in this case was simply to tell the truth. So B star of V is just equal to V. Okay, so that's the Nash equilibrium bidding function. So what can I say about the expected revenue? Well, the person with the highest bid is going to win, but they're only going to pay the value of the second highest bid. So the expected revenue in this case, let's call it expected revenue in the second, so I'll put a two here, uh, is equal to it's going to be equal to the second or the expected value of the second highest of our um, bids, which are also equal to their true values. So it's going to be the expected value of the second order statistic. Okay. And what was that? We've already calculated it. It was n minus 1 over n plus 1. Okay. That's how we calculate the revenue, expected revenue in these auctions. And in general, you would just take the bidding function and then uh, do this. Fi uh, using order statistics is going to help you. But notice something unusual here. We've had this same expression, n minus 1 over n plus 1. n minus 1 over n plus 1. Okay. They are exactly the same. The revenue in these two auctions, or the expected revenue, is exactly the same. Now, in the first priced auction, people weren't bidding their true values. They were choosing to reduce their value by a certain amount. When we changed the rules of the game, they did want to bid their true values, but they were only paying the amount of the second highest bid. So these players are we're adjusting the game and they're adjusting their behavior at the same time. Nothing's being held fixed apart from one thing the expected revenue stays exactly the same. What's truly remarkable, and we won't prove it, is that this is a very general result about auction theory. It's called the revenue equivalence theorem. This is kind of an exemplifying example of the revenue equivalence theorem in practice. So let's have a look at what the revenue equivalence theorem says. So we've now shown formally that even though the bidding strategies in first price and second price auctions are different, the expected revenue for the seller is exactly the same in both types of auctions. This surprising result is actually a, an example of a very general, a far more general theorem called the revenue equivalence theorem. We won't prove the revenue equivalence theorem in this lecture, um, I believe if you take Mathematical Economics 2 next semester, then this, this theorem will be very much part of the type of work you will do there. 
but let me tell you what the theorem is and how to interpret it. So the theorem is that for any single item auction where n risk neutral bidders have independent values drawn from a continuous distribution and the highest bid wins. So that, that, that two criteria, those two criteria have been met in both of the auctions we've looked at so far. In both cases, the highest bid wins. And we were looking at n risk neutral bidders with independent values that were all uniformly distributed on the same interval. As long as those two conditions are met, the auction will always yield the same expected revenue. That is the result of this truly remarkable theorem. So if we, if we keep the assumptions, for instance, that we have n risked neutral bidders with independent uniformly distributed values, you could imagine designing many other types of auctions. Uh, we had first price and second price, but what about third price, fourth price, fifth price, and so on? Well, I can tell you now that in all of those cases, the conditions for the revenue equivalence theorem have been met. And so the, uh, the expected revenue for the seller is exactly the same in all of those types of auctions. Indeed, many treatments of auction theory start by proving the revenue equivalence theorem and then use that as a basis for finding the equilibrium strategies of various different uh, auctions. You could say, if I know the expected revenue has to be the same as a first price auction, then what would the bidding function have to be? So in terms of uh, prediction, it's very powerful, but it's also incredibly useful for analysing a wide variety of auctions. One way of thinking about the revenue equivalence theorem is that if you're designing an auction and you change the rules, then the bidders will also adjust their behaviour. OK, so in a sense, that's quite obvious that um, you can't keep their behavior fixed while you're changing the rules of the game. What is surprising is that their behavior changes in a precise way. In fact, in such a way that the expected revenue uh, remains fixed. Now, before we get too carried away, I should mention uh, some important cases where revenue equivalence fails. So when different auction formats will indeed have different expected revenues. So one case where this occurs is when we drop the assumption of risk neutrality. So if bidders are risk averse, then the result does not follow. Another case is where valuations are not independent. So uh, there's something called a common value auction, essentially when people's values are correlated in some way. Uh, then in that case, the conditions for revenue equivalents are not met and the theorem does not hold. Another example where the revenue equivalence theorem does not hold is when in an auction there are multiple identical items being sold. So, for example, the 3G and 4G, uh, 4G um, telecommunications licenses, uh, when these are being auctioned by governments around the world, they're selling many licenses to businesses and these licenses are all effectively the same. So in, a, in an auction like that, the revenue equivalence theorem uh, the conditions are not met and the theorem does not hold. What is perhaps more interesting for us is that even when we look at uh, cases where the revenue equivalence theorem does hold, so our first price and second price sealed bid auctions do indeed have the same expected revenue. There is something to, to notice about this. If you're designing the auction, if you're selling the object by an auction, then knowing that the expected, rev expected revenue is the same in these two auction formats is one thing. But this random revenue, uh, we're not talking about the same risk in both of these auctions. The risk, has this, the risk in each case has the same expected value. But in the exercise class, what we'll show is that the variance of revenue in these auctions is indeed different. And we'll be very precise about this. I've, I'm showing you the actual uh, calculations for the variance here. And in particular, that the variance of revenue in a first price auction is less than the variance in a second price auction. In the exercise class, I want you to prove this. So I'll, I've given you the tools in the exercise class to work through this problem. Um, 
and in particular noticed that variants you could think of as a bad thing. So risk averse people don't like variants. So uh, if the seller is risk averse, then even though the expected value of revenue, the expected revenue is the same for a first price and a second price auction, if they choose a first price auction, then revenue is in a sense less risky. It has lower variance. So that concludes our coverage of auction theory. Uh, we've given a short but a detailed introduction into the topic. And if you choose to take the subject higher, you'll find many of the techniques developed here useful. I think if you take uh, Mathematical Economics 2 next semester, you'll delve much deeper into auction theory. Indeed, most of the semester is devoted to auction theory. So that should be very interesting. In the next lecture, we're going to study bargaining theory. In particular, we're going to look at John Nash's 1950 paper on the bargaining problem. This is just about my favourite paper in economics of all time. I can't wait to teach you about it. In the meantime, take care.